My name is Susan Connor. I've been a professor here at the John Marshall Law School for 30 plus years. I was recruited to Chicago from Hawaii by a certain David Kellys who convinced me that I should come here and work closely with him and uh, about 12 days after I arrived he moved to Hawaii. <laughs> but that opportunity allowed me to meet two wonderful people who are here in spirit though not in body today with us I'm sure, uh, Marlon Smith and Richard Babcock and I also want to uh, remember um, Norman Williams. I think he would have been real happy to be here as well. We're going to this afternoon spend some time on bringing the lessons uh, if that's the appropriate word, of the quiet revolution and what lessons uh, may be still transferable into the future from the past in the context of the Midwest. So the first uh, panelist will be John DeVries. He is the principal and national director of strategic development planning. John's background and resume is deep and broad. He has ex extensive experience in real estate analysis. Uh, he served, serves as the founding director of the Marshall Bennett Institute of Real Estate at the Walter E. Heller College of Business Administration at Roosevelt University. He was a principal in Arthur Anderson's Hospitality and Real Estate Group, both in Miami and Chicago. And more relevant to today's presentation, he's recently worked with the Urban Land Institute Chicago on an Indiana-Illinois infrastructure investment plan, the Lakeshore Industrial Heritage Corridor. John? Thank you, Susan. Uh, as Susan says, we're going to move from Hawaii and Florida and upstate New York uh, back to the heartland, back to Chicago. Um, it would be easier to be talking about Hawaii today, but I've got all my good colleagues from Lambda Alpha and the city and the audience, so I know you're all going to keep me, keep me on focus. Um, we hope that this uh, model that I'm going to describe to you uh, can represent uh, at least a current incarnation of, of what the quiet revolution would look like in a very, very applied way. Uh, I'm not an attorney, so you're going to hear this from the lens of uh, more of an economic development and a planning perspective uh, than from a legal perspective. Um, this plan was also tailored, uh, I think, to fit this decade. Um, uh, we've heard today uh, about some of the uh, political and cultural changes that are going on that, that make planning uh, more challenging, and, and we certainly had that in mind in creating this plan. And in that regard, it's a plan we think that fits fiscal realities, it, uh, it fits uh, the kinds of decision making that uh, we think local uh, jurisdictions can agree upon, um, and it is specifically tailored to be attractive to private investment as well as government investment because, as we know, in this era of fiscal uh, shortages, uh, there isn't enough public money in the world to begin tackling a lot of the projects that, uh, that were planned in the previous several decades. <clears throat> uh, ULI uh, nationally, uh, in anticipation, I think, of some of the legislation hoped for from the current administration uh, designated uh, several cities around the U.S. Uh, through the Curtis Initiative. Uh, and that initiative was designed to uh, encourage municipalities to think creatively about uh, infrastructure, uh, state, federal, and local investments, uh, and the future of community and economic development. Uh, to that end, uh, ULI Chicago formed a committee of some 50 members, including a cross-section of public, private, and, and nonprofit members. Very early in its work, uh, the committee uh, focused on some uh, very uh, game-changing uh, criteria, creating criteria that focused on economic, economic growth, um, and that would integrate uh, local decision-making with uh, land use and infrastructure projects. Uh, we applied the model, and really, the, the model really evolved during the course of doing this over two years. Uh, we applied it in two areas. The area you're going to hear about today, we ended up calling the Lakeshore Industrial Heritage Corridor, and there was a broader initiative at identifying some interrelated uh, suburban projects. Uh, the criteria that the committee utilized included economic competitiveness, uh, opportunity, 
opportunity being projects that in some respect were teed up either by the public or private sector. Uh, we did have a strong desire to build environmental sustainability into the projects that were chosen. Uh, support, we look for projects that could garner if they did not already have some level of public support. And as I mentioned, funding and financial feasibility. Uh, we think this is a model that will end up having some applicability, we hope, uh, to some of the uh, regions you come from. Um, our st first step was to uh, identify a, a uh, actionable sub-area. Uh, we then scanned all of the infrastructure projects that had been discussed or even in any stage of planning uh, for that area. We evaluated them using these five criteria on the left. We came up, as you will see, with a priority list of infrastructure and land use projects. We conducted additional research and then we documented in, in, this, uh, in this report. In the course of doing this, we reviewed over 60, identified and reviewed over 60 infrastructure, housing, and economic development projects, out of which we prioritized 13. Now, I must say that the other thing in back of our mind was the, was the hope that uh, the federal funding uh, formulas were going to be changed in the direction of this, the proposed and much discussed sustainable community funding initiatives. Uh, certainly some of those initiatives have been talked about. Uh, two years ago we had uh, three of the cabinet secretaries here in Chicago to announce a new level of collaboration between transportation and environmental and housing projects and under the umbrella of sustainable communities. And certainly we were looking at that framework in putting this together. Um, assuming some federal uh, decisions are made on spending going forward, uh, hopefully this model will, uh, will also be applicable to, uh, to that new federal framework if it evolves. <clears throat> um, now on the issue of, of trying to work on things that could be done, uh, we did not presume uh, to uh, represent the public. We identified projects that already had some level of public approval. Uh, we went after a very defined, as you'll see, a very defined and focused geography. And a geography we thought that we could handle uh, in a given number of project years and within a given budget framework. Uh, we were particularly looking for projects in this case that were multi-jurisdictional and, and in the case of this corridor, by state. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are also prioritizing projects that either had or had the potential of achieving both public and private funding. And last but not least, projects again that would meet that sustainable uh, communities criteria of combining transportation community and environmental uh, tasks. Uh, the, ta the target region we ended up defining uh, consisted of a string, a necklace of Lake Michigan lakefront communities by state, uh, the state line running roughly through the middle of this area. Uh, bounded on the north by the U.S. Steel Southwark site, uh, which is now being relabeled Lakeside as a redevelopment project, and on the south side by the U.S. Steel Gary Works. Uh, these two steel works uh, were arguably uh, two of the largest uh, integrated uh, steel operations uh, in the world. Uh, Southworks, of course, has gone away. U.S. Steel Gary Works is still very much, very much alive. But Southworks, at its, uh, at its peak, employed 30 uh, to 40,000 people in South Chicago. Uh, as a result of that industrial heritage, I guess you could say the area shared a lot of problems. Uh, we chose to say the area uh, shared a lot of assets. It has a very much because of this shared industrial heritage uh, with integrated mills on both ends, using a lot of suppliers located between them. There was a lot of shared utility, road work, railroads, waterways, and utilities in place. <clears throat> We also wanted to focus on things that unified the region, uh, both from an industrial and economic development viewpoint and from an ecological recreational viewpoint. As much as possible, again, given fiscal constraints, we sought to repurpose existing infrastructure, not always create brand new infrastructure. And in particular, we wanted to leverage the recent uh, creation in Northwest Indiana of their first regional economic development entity, the Northwest Regional Development Authority, funded partially by the sale of the uh, Indiana Turnpike, partially by the dedication of revenues 
from uh, three of the uh, northwestern Indiana counties and partially from casino revenues. So with all of that as a preface, we identified 13 high impact projects. Again, not accidentally that they would be in these three buckets. Transportation to appeal to state and federal funding, community to appeal to a wide array of state and federal housing and community development programs, and environmental waterfront and parks, very much tied into brownfields and EPA projects. Uh, also transportation projects that would tie this defined by state uh, corridor together. We're gonna talk briefly about each one of these. And then in the theme of repurposing, uh, this is an area uh, that, as you can tell from my example of the U.S. Steel uh, Lakeside or uh, South Works, this is an area that employed tens of thousands of, of workers um, and still has a vibrant core industrial base. BP is rebuilding its refinery down there, and I think it is maybe the largest private uh, industri single industrial investment going on in the United States right now. Uh, we're talking billions. Uh, and there is, there is a core industrial uh, community there that we still want to protect. Having said that, we have vast areas of empty industrial space, uh, close to 4,000 acres in the southern portion of Chicago in the Calumet area, about 1,500 of which would probably be suitable for uh, active redevelopment. Um, and ag again, stretching all the way from uh, the Indiana line to Gary, uh, a series of, of, of major sites that previously had industrial or railroad uses, but that would now be suitable for repurposing. So the related goal here is, if you're not gonna have these as major, major employment centers, can they be repurposed for major population centers? And to undergird and undermine, uh, 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 undergird and, uh, that entire effort, two major environmental initiatives, an open spaces initiative on the Illinois side in the Calumet area, and the Hammond Lakes project on the Indiana side to provide amenities for the new communities and to start repurposing this area as a tourism ecological destination uh, as well as a historically industrial location. Uh, this is a map, I hope at this scale you can see this, um, but to get you oriented here, if you can see where um, the Skyway or, or Route 90 touches the lake, um, that is really where the state line uh, comes up to the lake shore. And if you follow that straight south, uh, it goes straight south there with uh, Route 41 on the right-hand side being the Indiana side of the border. And, uh, and on the left, you can see uh, the Calumet Open Space Preserve with the, uh, with the green areas uh, being the Chicago, Illinois side. On the far north, you can see uh, the, what's labeled the US 41 relocation. That is a relocation of Lakeshore Drive within the South Works uh, Lakeside site. And on the far right at the bottom, uh, you can see the, um, the harbor configuration of the shore, which is the location of the Gary Works. So turning first to uh, some of the catalytic uh, transportation projects, uh, the extension of the CTA red line in Chicago. This would be a five and a half mile extension of the red line, which now terminates on the Dan Ryan at 95th Street. Also has its uh, terminus faci uh, servicing facilities there, um, uh, located virtually in the median area. Uh, this would extend south to 130th and provide uh, three new stations in the Roseland area, 103rd, 111th, 115th. Um, at 130th, it would be the potential of a major park and ride facility of 2,000 plus cars. Uh, it would decrease travel time to the downtown uh, substantially. It would provide uh, substantial enhanced capacity uh, for the red line. Uh, and importantly, uh, we mentioned the word intermodal here because it does provide the potential at 130th Street of connecting with the South Shore Line, which parallels it there. So you'd have the potential of commuters coming in from Indiana being able to switch to the CTA and, uh, and be on the CTA system for all the intermediate stops that the CTA makes. So again, we're looking at uh, bi-state labor impacts, bi-state transportation impacts. Uh, arterial connecting roads, uh, US 41 uh, being re relocated and repurposed on the north, 
Uh, we proposed a series of improvements to it. US 12 and US 20 all cluster uh, near the Skyway, crossing the Indiana border, and then have to go through a series of, of local east-west streets to get themselves through Hammond. Uh, so we have proposed a, a bypass route through Hammond that would also eliminate three of the major rail crossings and, and tie all of those uh, roadways together in an efficient way. US 12 also has the purpose of serving the Gary International Airport, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, there's also been discussed for quite a long period of time the potential of tying uh, the South Chicago Industrial Base to the Indiana Heavy Truck Route, which ends 1.1 miles short of the state line. Therefore, you see trucks uh, being parked in parking lots and the steel half unloaded so they can drive into Illinois. You can imagine how efficient that operation is. So uh, we did get a first leg up on that by building the new 126th Street uh, road for the Ford Motor Supplier Park to heavy truck standards, but we do not have the connection between Indiana and the Ford Supplier Park or other points uh, 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 currently funded. Uh, underway is another project, though, related to uh, the uh, re, uh, remodeling, if you will, or the retooling of the Ford plant and the building of the Ford Supplier Park, and that is $142 million of grade separation and road configuration at Torrance and Brainerd, which again will uh, substantially increase access uh, between Indiana and Chicago, tie those labor markets together, uh, give tr good excellent truck access um, from both Northwest Indiana and uh, South Chicago to the major freeways. Another example of a related improvement um, is the hopes uh, of Indiana to continue to expand the South Shore. Uh, we're not advocating that in this report, but we are advocating increased uh, ridership and utilization of the South Shore. The South Shore has had ridership go up close to 20% in this decade. So I consider that uh, it has been a regional success, uh, but it is constrained. Uh, so uh, one of the recommendations of this report, which is now underway, the city in Chicago is adding another track at the Kensington Junction, which will uh, relieve a major bottleneck uh, for even the existing level of South Shore traffic and allow future trains to be added in the future. I've already mentioned we have the potential of a new shared station with the CTA at 130th Street. And what's important, again, from the viewpoint of attracting denser and private, denser development and private development is the possibility of TOD development on the Hegwish Station in Chicago, the Hammond East Chicago, and the Gary Stations in Indiana. The Gary International Airport um, has actually been operated by a joint uh, Gary Chicago uh, uh, Commission since 1995. It has is, it is not lived up to its potential. It, is, it has received uh, recently uh, funding to move uh, some rail lines which will allow the extension of the runway. Uh, it has also recently completed a business plan which, which, uh, which was, was undertaken coinciding with, with this effort uh, to demonstrate the feasibility of air freight, expanded air freight, air passenger, uh, and, and charter operations here. Good improvements we've already talked about, uh, and with better service and more frequent service out of Gary, there is a potential for using a lot of the vacant area around this node for a new generation of industrial, commercial, and office uses. A related project is the potential of locating the high-speed rail terminal for Gary on the airport property in a way that would serve the South Shore and both lines, uh, both proposed high-speed lines, one to Detroit and one through Cleveland to the East Coast. This is very conceptual at this point, but we have the land, we have the railroad right-of-ways, um, we have the roadways, we have the tollways, we have a, a, a major combinant confluence of transportation assets here that have never really been put together to have the kind of regional impact that they could. Um, another transportation um, imper improvement, again, building off of repurposing existing infrastructure, not necessarily proposing a new billion-dollar road, is Klein Avenue, which was built as an elevated expressway 
to serve waterfront steel plants. Those steel plants now have a fraction of their employment, as I've mentioned, so there's really little need for an elevated expressway to get 50 or 60,000 cars to the waterfront. Uh, and the structure is approaching obsolescence. And while we were doing this report, the bridge over the Indiana Harbor Ship Canal is closed for unsafe conditions. So we are recommending that the Klein Avenue be reconfigured. We are not advocating a particular alignment in this report, but we are saying start bearing in mind accessing residential projects to the waterfront, recreational uses to the waterfront, uh, perhaps much of this becoming surface roadways that tie into the existing redevelopment of uh, East Chicago instead of an elevated expressway, uh, which we no longer need. Um, now turning to the community repopulating projects, uh, starting on the north, Lakeside South Works. Uh, this is a massive project that's been through, um, I think fair to say, two decades of planning efforts. Uh, but now the city of Chicago has stepped up uh, with TIF and other forms of assistance. Um, it has been through the approvals process. It has now had a selected uh, developer, a master developer, McCaffrey. Uh, US 41 is under construction. The park district has in fact put in some of the parks uh, and stuff that are associated with that along both the lakefront and the, and the arterial itself. Uh, this will be in fact a, a new town uh, in this portion of Chicago, 14,000 new homes, several million square feet of commercial space. Uh, the city has reserved and uh, required uh, the lakefront park system to be extended along this entire waterway. Some of the uh, retaining walls in the middle of the site will be retained as an industrial heritage park location. Uh, there is the potential here for a major, uh, major marina. So once again, repopulating an area that has lost its traditional um, employment base. Another potential in Chicago, again, East 134th Street, an obsolete former mobile home community, uh, 120 acres of continuous uh, single ownership, uh, TIF in place, the potential for 950 new homes, uh, something that could uh, very easily benefit from some of the trans ro road and uh, red line extension improvements we've already mentioned. Uh, but very importantly, we're going to talk about both uh, the Calumet Open Space Plan and the Hammond Lakes Project. And this is one of those projects that through uh, trail systems uh, and uh, scenic easements and so on could directly connect uh, to both of those projects as uh, environmental amenities. Whiting has a major project underway connecting its uh, historic downtown to the waterfront, connecting to the regional trail system. Um, lots of opportunities now for new infill development near the lakefront. This really coming down, starting with the South Works, going to Hegwish, now going to the Whiting Lakefront, then going down to the North Harbor development. Uh, this is planned for several thousand units. Uh, Community Builders is in here as a delect, uh, selected private developer. Over $110 million of infrastructure in our, here already, but again, several hundred million more of private investment to go with this and continue the repopulating uh, down the lakefront. Uh, the overpass here again is for illustrative purposes, but could be part of the repurposed Klein Avenue to connect all of this new population to the lakefront. Continuing down the lakefront, uh, what we're now calling the South Shore Lakefront, on the south side there's a potential of one of the two Gary casinos being moved, opening up a waterfront anchor down there, uh, rail lines being relocated in here, um, and, and, and the recreational infrastructure that will begin uh, with, um, uh, begin with, at, with the Whiting Park extending down through um, East Chicago extending down to the South Shore so that a lot of the implementation ideas of the Marquette plan actually start achieving some reality in buildable communities. And then uh, tying a lot of this together, uh, starting to redefine this area as a tourism destination, as a regional recreation asset, uh, over 3,900 acres. This is a plan the city of Chicago has underway uh, through either donations or purchase. I think the city has close to 1,000 acres that it's, it's been able to bring under public ownership since this plan was approved. Uh, there will be a series of trails, environmental improvements, um, and importantly and heavily recommended 
in this report was to connect directly then to the Hammond Lakes project, which has unfolded since the Calumet Open Space Plan began. And there's some $54 million worth of trail improvements now approved by the Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority that have the potential now of tying into the Calumet Plan on the Chicago side and tying these several residential communities that we've talked about together. Uh, also a new pavilion so that we start seeing some very family-oriented amenities to serve this whole area. Uh, you can see details on all of these projects on the ULI Chicago website, uh, the Lakeshore Industrial Heritage Corridor, as well as the Suburban Regional Infrastructure Plan. And for more information, you can contact Cindy McSherry at ULI or, or myself. Um, just briefly, kind of where does this leave us? Uh, next steps on this plan were to, uh, as much as possible, see it incorporated in uh, the two regional entities that impact this area, CMAP and Northern Illinois Planning District Commission, as well as Northwest Indiana Regional Development Authority, get these ideas incorporated into their plans in a, in a bi-state way. Uh, secondly, go back to the local communities uh, within whose jurisdictions a lot of these plans take place and make sure that these are highly prioritized and educating the public about how these projects interrelate and uh, two plus two equals five if you start collaborating across some of these, these town and state lines to achieve them. And last but not least, hopefully uh, position this particularly important region for the Midwest uh, for the next round of sustainable community initiatives and funding if we uh, cross that bridge. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me now introduce Bill Anaya. He's a partner at Arnstein and Lear in the Complex Litigation and Commercial Real Estate Transaction Group. He has deep and wide as well experience in uh, civil and administrative and commercial disputes, environmental law, or regulatory law, uh, and he is an adjunct professor at the John Marshall Law School. Someplace else as well, but I won't mention that. <laughs> just happens when you get old, people ask you to speak. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to speak to this conference. It's, it's rare that I get an opportunity. It's not always that we get an opportunity to, to, to speak at, you know, at a conference at the level that's a little higher uh, elevated. Most conferences are at 15 to 30,000 feet, if you will. If they use a metaphor, we get to look down and we get to opine and think about uh, great thoughts. We just heard John talk about something that I think is at the 15,000 foot level, some things that are practical, that are under study, that are, that are working. It's not the Supreme Court's most recent takings case. It's not the trench warfare that goes on with mechanics, liens, and subcontractors. We get to have that 15,000 to 30,000 foot discussion. Well, I'm at 45,000. I'm way up in the air, and you're going to be, it, my kids will confirm that I'm in the stratosphere a lot. They call it the ozone layer, and, 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 and I'm there. And, and to, to the, the, your point about, you know, what I do in the complex litigation, really I'm a dirt lawyer. I'm an environmental lawyer that spends a lot of time in the trenches, and I love the opportunity to have this 45,000-foot view for you. Originally, when, when Celeste asked me about this, it was a, it was a, I'm a downstate boy, I grew up downstate, got out of the service, found myself in the region of North, uh, North uh, actually Michigan City, Indiana, I guess it's kind of in the middle of the state toward, the, over, toward South Bend over there. And I remember as a kid, my father would object to the fact that he had to pay taxes to support the city of Chicago. And I and remember that just being a bugaboo for him and that kind of a thing. It was very parochial, it was very uh, central Illinois centric and that sort of thing. And then I moved to Indiana and we get the total benefit of, the, uh, of having the city of Chicago within striking districts, at least that's the way we felt, without ever having to pay for it. It was the, like, I said, Dad, move to Michigan City. You're going to be happy there. You know, that kind of a thing. But it's always bothered me that that's true, that the region uh, gets benefits from the city of Chicago but doesn't have to do it, uh, doesn't have to pay for those benefits. So it occurred to me that we could talk about other areas where people have taken geography out, if you will, or, or re reconfigured geography 
to come up with another governmental plan. And what I originally decided to call this, this talk was Lessons Learned from the New York and New Jersey Port Authority. And after having done my study, preparing my outline, I came to the conclusion after seeing what it is that we're doing here in the Midwest, I can't call it Lessons Learned because we haven't learned anything. <laughs> what I can say is there's lessons that could be learned from the New York and New Jersey Port Authority. And I'll give you a kind of a background of that and what, what happened there in that part of the country. And, and I, we heard this morning about upstate and the Adirondacks. I, I'm thinking that's a pretty much that northeast quarter must be full of communists or socialists or something because they seem to have an idea of government that is apparently different than the popular conception. But we can talk about the Port Authority of New, New, New Jersey and New York. It's a port district. It was comprised of the waterways within the estuaries of New York and New Jersey. It's a 25-mile radius of the Statue of Liberty. It's 1,500 square, square mile district. It's a big district in, in, in a densely populated area. It has 650 miles of shoreline in the vicinity of New York and New Jersey. It is a traditional port, but it's so much more. Uh, the Port of New York, for example, is not in New York. The Port of New York is in New Jersey. They don't have any problem with that. That made sense to them. There was a reason to do that. It was because they had this superstructure that we're going to talk about. But along with having the Port Authority and having that extrajudicial or extra-governmental entity that, that covers it, they recognize the role of infrastructure in the development of their region. They also have a very premium on, on space. They're not quite as we have space. We, you know, they, they find it incredulous to come here to Chicago and within an hour we can be in the cornfields. You can drive for an hour and go five miles in, in, in the New York metropolitan area. And, 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 and that, that concept of being here. But the infrastructure was key to the development of a port authority and the things that went with it. And they recognized that the port authority would have a role in development and that infrastructure is key to development and land use planning at 15, at 30, and at 45,000 feet, to be metaphorical, is critical to development. They developed as part of the Port Authority, and this it all has a, a theme to it, the, all of the Hudson River crossings from Manhattan to New Jersey, the Hudson River, the, I beg your pardon, the Holland Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel, and the George Washington Bridge. From uh, Staten Island to New Jersey, there's three crossings. They have a Port Authority bus terminals. Actually, they have several of them. They've developed their high-speed uh, rail, the, the, the rapid transit, like we have our L, uh, called the PATH. Uh, we'll talk about that. They have all of the major airports in the area that they in, 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 inculcate into their authority. They have LaGuardia. They have JFK. They have New York Liberty International. They have the Teterboro Airport in Teterboro, New Jersey, and they have Stewart International Airport near a town called Newburgh, New York, which is 55 miles north of New York City. That's the Port Authority. That's, that's the idea of an infrastructure. That's the idea of having a holistic plan. That's the idea of not having this state line, John, between Illinois and Indiana. It, 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 it's saying these borders don't matter. What matters is that we have an appropriate infrastructure. They also have real estate development. They have real estate development. We all know about the World Trade Center site and how it, its genesis started with the, one of the Rockefellers with the bank, uh, with, with the, I think it was Chase Bank at the time. They're even in the process now of negotiating the takeover of the Atlantic City International Airport because it's all part of this holistic plan. How did this begin? Well, that, that's kind of where they're at. It started with a lawsuit. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I love a story with a happy ending. A lawsuit's always a happy ending for somebody, usually the lawyer. And it started with a, a lawsuit over rail rates. Not had anything to do with, with ports. The Interstate Commerce Commission at that time, who was uh, had jurisdiction over the lawsuit, banged the two states' heads together and said they ordered them to work together and to, quote, subordinate their own interest to the public interest. What a concept. What a concept for government to subordinate each individual state's interest in the public interest. Okay, they said, they'll, they'll do that. And they established the Harbor Development Commission, which is a joint advisory commission 
that was established in 1917 to establish this bi-state authority to oversee efficient economic development of the Port Authority. In 1921, the Port Authority was the direct uh, descendant of that activity, and it was formed with an interstate compact between New Jersey and New York. Compacts are specifically described in the United States Constitution, lest you hear that, you know, the, the, uh, somebody's rights are being tr trampled on. This is constitutional that two states can have a compact, and, 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 and they did it. It was designed during the progressive area, era. You remember the progressive area. It was in the, in, in the teens and 20s of, of, of the past decade. The idea was to reduce corruption in government, to increase the efficiency of government. It was to be independent from political pressure, and in the process, it probably created some issues of unaccountability. But how can you, we're never going to get rid of corruption in government, and especially a, a, a democracy. We're just going to have that issue. But even in dictatorships, you've got corruption. Look at Muammar Gaddafi. I mean, it's not, that, that kind of a thing is a wonderful idea. It, it, it's, it's good the way they did it, the way they develop it. But the really remarkable thing that they did was to create efficiencies in the, in, the, in the art of governing. And they did that by taking out the political pressure. They created this independent body. It's jointly headed by the governors of New York and New Jersey. Each governor, with the advice and consent of the state legislature, appoints six members to the board. Each of the commissioners serves six years without pay. The governor can veto actions by the commissioners of his or her state. The meetings are public. There's no taxing authority. They can't collect a nickel from anybody from a tax perspective. And they don't get any tax money from state or local governments. They generate their revenue by tolls and fees and, and rents from their uh, uh, facilities uh, that, that, that they operate. But they have to justify that in terms of uh, uh, fees and, 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 and activities uh, related to their infrastructure improvements. They are treated and being treated sort of like, treated, they're, they're, they're benefited by the business community. If they're not a success, they don't get fees and, 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 and tolls. What facilities do they have? We, we alluded to them a minute ago. The Port Jersey Marine Terminal in Bayonne in Jersey City. The Brooklyn Point Authority Marine Terminal, which is a combined terminal of Brooklyn Piers and Red Hook Container Facility. The Howland Hook Terminal, the biggest uh, uh, port, the Port Newark Elizabeth Marine Terminal in New Jersey. JFK of the airports, LaGuardia, New York Liberty, Stewart International, Teterboro. They've got a heliport in Manhattan, the downtown heliport. Bridges and tunnels, all part of the infrastructure, all part of a holistic plan. It's not just your mother's part authority. It's not just for boats. It's for the whole idea to support jobs in, jobs out, infrastructure uh, development, all the things that we were talking about uh, that John's commented about between our two states. The George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, and the Holland Tunnel co connect New Jersey to Manhattan. Staten Island has the Gothels Bridge, the Bayonne Bridge, and the Outer Bridge. They have a bus and rail system, a Port Authority Trans-Hudson Rapid Transit System, the so-called path thing, path, path Transit Authority, Manhattan and New Jersey. They have an air tram from Newark that connects uh, Newark uh, with New Jersey trans Transit, the New Jersey Transit, and Amtrak. They have the air tram for JFK that links JFK with Howard Beach Subway and the Jamaica Subway. They have the major bus, to, uh, uh, must de bus depots at 42nd Street, the George Washington bus station, and they have the Journal Square Transportation in New Jersey, in Jersey City. They have joint development real estate ventures. They have the Teleport Communications Center on Staten Island, the Bathgate Industrial Park, the thing that we were talking about here. They own an industrial park. They charge rents for it. Uh, Essex County Re Resource Recovery Facility, call it a dump, back in the day. It's now called the Resource Recovery Facility. That's what I do for a living. I like the fact that we turn my dirty dirt into fancy names like that. The Legal Center in uh, uh, New Jersey, the Queens West, the Fort Waterfront in Hoboken, and of course the World Trade Center. They're not finished. They're doing the World Trade Center redevelopment. They're putting on a new terminal at JFK. 
They're redeveloping Newark's Liberty International Airport. They're going to replace the Gethels Bridge from Staten Island to Manhattan, and they're taking control of the Atlantic City International Airport to expand their uh, bases. The scope of the New York and New Jersey Port Authority is broader than the Port Authority itself. It's used as a vehicle for economic development, land use, and infrastructure. What do we have in Illinois? We have a patchwork. We have a patchwork of competing many local parochial interests. We have my dad running a bunch of little spots all over the, uh, the state of Illinois. The, the International Port District of the Port of Chicago uh, was uh, created in 18, uh, was created a, uh, as a result of the canal building in the 1840s, 1850s. In 1909, the Chicago Harbor and Water Waterway Commission offered uh, a plan to construct several piers leading to the construction of Navy Pier. In 1913, the Illinois General Assembly passed legislation to acquire, develop, own, and operate a port facility within the city limits. In 1921, uh, the Illinois General Assembly passed the Lake Calumet Harbor Act authorizing the city to, be a, to build a deep water port at Lake Calumet. Later that, uh, 1921, the city adopted the Van Visigen Plan which is the basic same framework that we live with today. Our plan, our development plan was created in 1921 and, and the Port Authority. Overseas shipping started in 1935, pretty much ended by 1972 when they shut down uh, uh, Navy Pier. Uh, in anticipation of opening the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1958, we expanded the turning basin in Lake Calumet created a, because we name everything after a politician, the Senator Dave Dowdy Harbor. Uh, 1960, Union Tank Car expanded the Turning Basin again. Uh, in 1972, Navy Pier was, quit, was stopped being used as a pier for uh, uh, commercial uh, 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 rail war, or commercial import. Uh, and the park, or the uh, uh, Chicago Port District came up, had an additional 190 acres. As it sits today, we, the, the, as far as development goes, in addition to having that port down in Lake Calumet, uh, they've got the Navy Pier development. In 1995, they converted uh, a landfill into Harborside Golf Course, and we have the port facilities currently in uh, 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 the Lake Calumet area. 26% of the land owned and operated by the Chicago Port Authority is Harborside Golf Course. 26% of the land used by the Chicago Port Authority is a golf course. 18% is in a thing called conservation lands. 24% is actually the harbor. 30% uh, is uh, a port industrial. We have 2% available for development. John, you could use, you, 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 you would like them to have that authority and would expand their 2% to 30%. Uh, that w there's a great deal of criticism, and I think some of it very, very rightfully so, that the Port Authority of Chicago takes care of a golf course, and that's really all that it does. It doesn't do anything else. It, there's been several moves to abolish it. Uh, what, else do, what else do we have in Illinois? We have the Upper Illinois River Development Authority. That's right, there is such a thing. But it's for Grundy, LaSalle, Bureau, Putnam, Kendall, and Marshall counties. It's compo composed of 18 members. 10 appointed by the governor and one by each county. Uh, it's uh, uh, to promote industrial, commercial, and residential development, transportation, and recreation activities, but only in those counties. Will County has uh, 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 just spent $1,000, $100,000 looking to have its own, whether it wants to develop its own Port Authority. The city of jo Joliet, there is a Joliet Port Authority uh, that was created under the Joliet, Par uh, po uh, Joliet Port District Act. I have to read my own writing, 70 ILCS, uh, uh, Section 1825. It's to promote all of these activities, including building airports, but it's only along the townships uh, adjacent to the Illinois Michigan Canal that runs through those counties. It's very parochial. It's very centric. They have the authority to buy. They have the th authority to uh, 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 acquire additional lands for these other activities. They have the Port Authority Act is pretty interesting. It's just geographically limited and extremely parochial. All of the members of that board have to be from Will County. There's a Seneca Port Authority for Seneca, Illinois, which is on the LaSalle County, uh, Grundy County border that has to do with rail port intermodal. 
That's the confluence of the Illinois-Michigan Canal, the Illinois River, Interstate 80, and the CSX road line. That's a really interesting project that's going out on that site, but it's very parochial. It's very limited to that. It's very development. And it has n the city of Chicago t turns up its nose at it because it, what's in it for us type of thing. There's also the Hammond Port Authority that's basically a recreational activity, and there's the Milwaukee Port Authority that's basically Milwaukee-centric. Uh, around Chicago, we have a patchwork of basically unconsolidated, inefficient, and largely ineffective governmental authorities regarding things like uh, infrastructure improvements and the things that John has talked about and the things we've talked about. A cure, okay, it's from 45,000 feet. Okay, it's from the stratosphere. Okay, it's going to be hard to get accomplished in the Midwest because we know what we're dealing with here, especially in Chicago. But were we to implement the port of Chicago, an interstate compact with Illinois and Indiana, God forbid, across the Cheddar Curtain, we ask Wisconsin to join. <laughs> but we could. I think they're Packer fans. Probably, I probably wouldn't want them. But it'll, certainly b between Illinois and Indiana, we could have that compact and we could start with something very similar to the New York, New Jersey Port Authority. Thank you. Well, our next speaker, Steve Elrod, has represented for, uh, for years more than two dozen local governments here in Illinois. He's got uh, much experience in areas of zoning and land use, as well as tax increment financing, annexation, historic preservation. So he's going to bring us from the stratosphere down to the ground and talk about an attempt uh, that was made in Techni, Illinois, in Cook County, to do some of, if not a revolution, at least a battle in what had been hoped to be a quiet way. Maybe it wasn't so quiet. Steve? We're going to queue up the... That would not be my PowerPoint. But as we're, um, as we're looking for it, uh, let me just give you a, a, a brief historical note. Uh, my, my first job out of law school was at Ross Hardy's, where I worked for Fred Bosselman and Dick Babcock and uh, Marlon Smith. Uh, David Callies had just left, but the Quiet Revolution uh, report that Professors Bosselman and Callies had um, prepared for the uh, President's Council on Environmental Quality was already 10 years old and still held in high esteem. Um, I was familiar with it. Um, it wasn't required reading, but if you want to work for the land use group at Russ Hardy's, it was wise reading. Um, and when I, when I was assigned to one of the firm's uh, municipal clients, the village of Northbrook, I was particularly thrilled because that town was part of Illinois' grandest efforts at that time to implement the teachings of the Quiet Revolution. Um, and engage in regional planning uh, for a large-scale developable area with major regional impacts. In, in Illinois, of all places, uh, Bill so appropriately went over the, the problems here in Illinois. L Illinois, the land of local government, more local governments than any, any other state in the country. Parochialism is a pastime here. Uh, local zoning and the vesting of control in, uh, of land use matters in, in the hands of local of an, and elected appointed officials, that's part of our DNA. So regional planning w w was kind of unheard of. And that's why it was so significant and monumental when a regional planning authority uh, created by the state of Illinois actually established a regional land use pact. And not for some remote farmland uh, in, in, in downstate Illinois. Rather, it was for more than 1,000 acres of, of prime, undeveloped land just a few miles north of, of, the, of the Chicago border in the heart of the prestigious North Shore. And that's why, also, it was not at all surprising that the whole thing crashed and failed, um, but after a good 15-year run. So this is the story of an attempted re revolution, an attempted quiet revolution, uh, one that almost made it. It's the story of Techni. And um, it's an interesting history lesson. 
a history lesson that I suspect I'll be held accountable for because as I look out in the, in the audience, I see the uh, Janet Johnson, the developer, as uh, attorney for the, the Techni area. I see David Silverman, one of the attorneys that worked on the matter. And I see Jack Siegel, one of the attorneys th who's now my partner that challenged um, the whole thing at one point in time. I'm sure that they'll all, um, they'll all make sure that I, that, that I get this right. Um, but it goes back several years, uh, back actually to 1973. Here, uh, you can see where the Techni area is located. For those of you not in the Chicago area, um, uh, just north north of the Chicago border, in between the the towns of uh, Northfield, Northbrook, and and Glenview. It's about 1,100 acres. At, in 1973, it was mostly unincorporated, um, and uh, it was right at the intersection of Willow and Waukegan roads. The owners of the, of, the, of the land were both religious orders, the Society of the Divine Word and the Missionary Sisters of the Holy Spirit. NIPSI, then NIPSI, the Northeastern Illinois Planning Commission, it was the official comprehensive planning agency for the six county metropolitan area created by the Illinois General Assembly back in 1957. Uh, in 2007, it, it merged with another planning agency uh, then known as CATS to form the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Uh, in 1972, right after the Quiet Revolution report was drafted, uh, one of NIPSI's biggest undertakings and proudest moments uh, was when it organized the, all the uh, municipalities around the Techni area to form the, the, um, the, the, the Techni Pact to govern the Techni property. Um, this is a larger view of the, of the Techni property, and the three municipalities that were part of it were Northfield, Northbrook, and, and, and Glenview, and the three uh, park districts, and NIPSI, all parties to a 1973 commission agreement. And the, the mission statement of the agreement uh, is kind of interesting, and it, it, you'll recognize it, um, David Callies and Fred Bosselman, because they, they, they really did follow some of the, uh, right, right out of the 1971 report. Here, the uh, Article 2A of the 73 agreement was that the subject property is located in a rapidly expanding and develop, uh, developing sub-regional area in which problems related to open space preservation, flood control, population density, joint operation of public facilities, ecological and economic impact, and multi-purpose development are ever multiplying, both in number and complexity. Looks like they were taking a page right out of the report. Um, the, the agreement was executed in, in 1973. The three municipalities um, formed the agreement and formed a governing board with a rotating chairman. The, the, the chairman was the village manager of, of each mun municipality and they rotated every three years. They were tasked with creating a land use plan. NIPSI provided um, all of the administrative and professional resources. And in 1975, they created a, they came up with a land use and boundary agreement. It was a separate agreement. They did it through the Illinois Constitution and the Illinois uh, Statutory Intergovernmental Agreement Act, <clears throat> because there really isn't, an, and still isn't, uh, does not exist an enabling authority in Illinois necessarily for um, a regional use of land use um, and zoning authority, local zoning authority. Um, but through this compact, through this agreement, the three municipalities set forth the land uses and the residential densities for the subject property. This is a page right out of the uh, Techni plan of the 1975 boundary agreement. <clears throat> it sets, spet, set forth what the proposed land uses would be throughout the property. Uh, you can't see it that well, but it's, it's primarily interesting for the times, 1975, primarily, almost exclusively residential, except for a small corner of the area. It was gonna be all multi, and, and the plan dealt with the various densities of the residential uses. It also set forth the future boundaries for the municipalities. Remember, that was all on incorporated territory in Cook County, so the boundaries of the municipalities were set. I colored it in so you can see that the Glenview boundary in red, the Northbrook boundary in blue, and the Northfield boundary, future boundaries, I should say, I in yellow. Um, there was <clears throat> some acknowledgement about the fact that Illinois law really didn't allow this specifically. So the municipalities had to figure out a way to uh, deal with the fact that they are agreeing on future boundaries and agreeing on future land uses. Um, and you can see that um, in, in the, uh, one of the clauses right out of Section 8 of the 75 Agreement. The parties recognize that questions of land use, zoning, and density 
for specific parcels in the subject property are ultimately within the exclusive jurisdiction of the village within whose boundaries the po those parcels are or will be located. Notwithstanding this exclusivity, the spirit and intent of the parties is set forth in those exhibits that I just showed you, and each village agrees to exert its best efforts to adhere to such spirit and intention. Um, so these two agreements together were, were heralded as a model of regional planning and intergovernmental cooperation and, and the divestiture of, of local control in, in, in recognition of issues of broader concern and impact. Um, and for the t first 12 years, it worked um, surprisingly well. But at the end of the day, this was just a contract. Um, fast forward to 1986, when one of the uh, uh, religious orders, then the missionary sisters, decided it was time to sell a little bit of their property. Uh, and it sold actually 73 acres to Kraft Foods for its corporate headquarters site. And that corporate headquarters site still is, sits there today. Um, it was um, the, the, the upper half of the yellow property in the area that was designated for Northfield. Um, it was at a density that was slightly higher than was contemplated. This was one of the only office areas contemplated in the 75 plan. And uh, when Kraft bought the property or was a contract purchaser for the property, it dutifully went to the um, Techni Joint Planning Commission for development approval. The chairman at the time was the Northfield Village Manager. And that's when things started to break down. The Northfield village manager didn't disclose to the rest of the parties, as he was required to do in the document, um, the existence of this proposal. And once um, Northfield announced that it was holding annexation agreement public hearings, it was thought to be kind of odd because the property was slated for Northfield. Um, why wouldn't the chairman um, of the commission, the then village manager of Northfield, bring this to the, to the commission? The, the density wasn't all that different. I don't think it would have received um, great objection. It was kind of curious. Uh, Northfield proceeded to negotiate directly with Kraft and, and announced annexation public um, uh, hearings and then ultimately annexed the property. Northbrook and Glenview said something's, something's up here. Um, and filed a lawsuit against Northfield, challenging a breach of agreement, a breach of contract, that it failed to bring the, the, the property to the, or this proposal to the commission as it was required to do. Well, during discovery, we found out that this, um, the, the, the craft proposal was really just the tip of the iceberg in titanic portions. Um, we learned that Northfield was actually in negotiations with the Society of the Divine Word for all of the blue, everything that was supposed to go to Northbrook, the, Nor the Northfield was actually talking with the societies. Janet, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that's true. And, 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 and keep in mind, the Society of the Divine Word, the religious order, was not a party to the 1975 agreement. It was not a party to any of these documents. It could perhaps a fallacy of the, of the earlier documents, but it had the ability to negotiate with whomever it wanted. Northfield, on the other hand, was duty bound by the agreement, but it was proceeding to discuss um, annexation and development of the entire property in the boundaries of, of um, Northfield. Glenview looked at this and said, well, to hell with this. Um, <laughs> Northfield's not by, uh, adhering to the agreement. We're not going to adhere to it either. And it began negotiations with the Missionary Sisters for annexation of everything in red, not for residential, but for high-density commercial, um, which left Northbrook, my client, um, sort of the last village standing. Uh, and uh, we uh, obviously were, were, were caught a little bit uh, off, uh, off guard um, and decided, well, if we can't beat them, let's join them. And we went directly to the Society of the Divine Word, directly to the fathers, and said, look, why are you going to Northfield when you should go to Northbrook? Northfield doesn't have water. Northbrook does. Northbrook, um, as you may have seen, it, it's not located on the lake, but it is the only community in Illinois that is not a shoreline community that has direct Lake Michigan water through a, uh, a pipeline that it installed in the early 60s and a water filtration plant that it negotiated to exist uh, to be on Lake Michigan outside the borders of its town. Uh, the Society of the Divine Word have, has a beautiful, beautiful structure that, that it could be um, subject to 
uh, fire or other damage, and water and water protection is a very, Im a very important um, issue to the society. And ultimately, we convinced them uh, through a variety of different manners, including an agreement um, to, uh, to, to allow for the development of the property um, in much the way that the society desired. Uh, and uh, ultimately, they agreed to uh, annex into uh, North Brook. Just taking a look at some of the newspaper articles, you can see uh, what, what went on. First, that's when North Brook uh, decided to sue to block the craft development. Uh, the fate of the Techni Han was, uh, plan was put in the court's hands. Border wars break out in the north suburbs. It gets more and more complex. And then ultimately, North Brook wins. Uh, Village and Techni agree to exclusive talks. What uh, I find is, uh, kind of interesting about this, not, not my uh, hair on, um, <laughs> on that photo, but rather, at, if you look at the bottom, Northfield's comment, it's astonished and deeply hurt at the, at, at the Techni deal. Um, interesting, the, the development that North Brook and the Society of the Divine Word ultimately agreed on is set forth more or less in this master plan. What's kind of interesting in it is that the land uses are quite different from that which existed in the 75 plan. In this plan, there's much more commercial, much more office and industrial uses. There's some very creative and innovative land use techniques, transfer of development rights from a site that, um, where that office W2 parcel is. Uh, it was actually a, a sanitary landfill. It's now a golf course, and all the density was transferred to the remainder of the development. Um, Techni uh, today uh, is is mostly developed uh, with with, uh, with with handsome uses, uh, a, a, a very vital uh, shopping center. Uh, you have 770 of the acres in Northbrook. 355 of the acres in Glenview, and just that 73 acres from Kraft in Northfield. Um, the Creighton Barrels Corporate Headquarters site is located there, the Five Seasons Health Club, the Willow Festival Shopping Center, um, and uh, more than 1,000 residential units on top of all of this development still exists here. And on top of all of that, about 100 acres of park and recreation land, and still 100 acres of land that was retained by the Society of the Divine Word for its own religious order uses. Um, just a, a quick sort of closing observation after that little history lesson. It's kind of interesting where, where we've come today, not only an attractive development that generally works in, in the area, um, despite the fact that it wasn't regionally planned. Uh, it, it may have been the result of regional or the result of an attempt at regional planning. But what's happening today is actually interesting. Come forward to 2011 and you have these, these three villages that were at war with each other at one time. Now, out of necessity, perhaps economic um, necessity, uh, talking to each other about every which way they can cooperate together. Uh, they, uh, you know, th these towns have been hit hard by reductions in, in real estate taxes and sales taxes, and a lot of their infrastructure and, and, and core services could be at jeopardy, and now they're partnering on, on various levels, forming consortiums to provide essential municipal services in much the same way that the Quiet Revolution recognized the regional provision of land use should be provided. For example, the public works departments of the three towns are, are, are now in a compact together to provide street sweeping. Uh, street lamp maintenance, snow plowing, traffic signal maintenance, uh, various utility services such as water reader meeting, water meter readings, um, and utility locatings, um, the, the public building and la uh, public buildings landscaping and janitorial services are now um, um, handled on a, on a joint basis. There are even um, talks now to uh, consider the uh, joint review of local building permits and planning documents. Um, so we could go a full circle and perhaps get to some regional zoning planning. It's not quite the quiet revolution in land use, uh, but it's a revolution nonetheless. Um, we, uh, we, the, the regionalism of, of municipal services is now perhaps land use is next. Thanks very much. <clears throat> In the spirit of anarchy that was techni, I'm not going to ask for written questions. Any questions of anyone? Sir? Steve gave this all you have to get this was going to be, but why has the effort to widen the portion of Little Road that is in Northfield failed for 40 years? 
let me repeat the question. Uh, or, or Willow Road, which is a major uh, collector street running through this now dense development, is basically a two-lane road that for well over a decade has been sought by some to be widened. Three decades. Three decades has sought by, oh, time flies, <laughs> sought by some to be widened, and that is thought to be the worst case scenario right. by many others. Why is that? That I can answer in one word. Northfield. Northfield. Uh, <laughs> the, broader, the broader answer is that, the, is that IDOT, which, which does have the land to expand, if you, if you drive down Willow Road, you'll know that all of the land is available. IDOT has a policy, not a, not a mandate or not a requirement, but a policy to defer to the host community on widening of its roads. It's, a, it's an IDOT road and it's politics and it's deferring at this particular moment in time to IDOT, uh, to um, Northfield. IDOT is deferring to Northfield. The visual uh, driving along Willow Road is quite amazing as there are dozens and dozens of signs. My young children have to cross this street <laughs> or words to that effect. Another question? Uh, Jack. Uh, this isn't a question. I uh, happen to represent a craft. And <laughs> to Northfield and get this over and plan the uh, The only time I've ever had the chief of police walk to my car to make sure that my tires were punctured because all the gentle people in Northfield were convinced it was going to widen Willow Road. The parcel of faith was you never widen Willow Road. John Eckerode was uh, a village man. Barbara Wick, Wick was the village president at the time. They both supported the annexation and so on. The leader of the opposition managed to get himself elected to the village presidency. Ousted John, ousted Barbara as village president. I, as counsel for Taft, 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 was invited to the living party. Each time the new village president in cahoots with the president, uh, Philip Morris, known as Crab. Welcome, welcome to this great development for those in Northfield. The best thing that ever happened in Northfield. We had a plan that was based upon not liking it well on the road. And we would have thought uh, the world was going to collapse with this project. It's been there for 30 years. It's the only project that ever presented a development or it turned out exactly as it says. Matter of full disclosure, Jack is my partner. He was not my partner, however, at the time that we were in bed. And second, I appreciate Jack's uh, elaboration on the history. I was only given 22 minutes on this panel, so that's how we can add a little more of the history. There was another question next to Jack. Anyone else? I, for one, am so uh, struck by the, by the serendipity of all of this that we've heard today. We have Ed Sullivan talking about the magic moments in 1973 in Oregon, and Nancy Stroud talking about the dream years that have recently turned into a nightmare, and Steve talking about the, uh, about the planner's dream, or so it would appear, that to these ears sounded like it blew up because of what a very few people did or didn't do. Any comments on, on that? On the one hand, we have this message from the quiet revolution, this makes good rational sense and it's good public policy. But on the other hand, kaboom. Any comments? I have a uh, Amber, I, have, I spent eight years as a city planner in Hammond. Now, that was more than a decade ago that I left. And so, a lot of this, you know, although I, I still have contact with some people that are new to me, um, and there is, uh, speaking of purpose, there's a weird curve, too. Um, and there is. I prefer to think of it as a boiler maker curve, but there. That's all alumni stuff. There's. There is a definite break, you know, at, 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 at the state line of power. Um, and you know, well, I'm, a, I'm a resident and over here, but spending that time over on the other side of the earth, uh, it's going to be a hard 
hard, it's going to be a hard sell because the, the whole pro, the whole project is in Illinois, it's all in Chicago. And Chicago is evil. Right? And, and <laughs> once you get over, you know, the, the curtain and uh, it, uh, how, how is that sale going? It's going, it's going as far as you now heard it today. Um, it's in this plan. But um, the original uh, plans seven or eight years ago uh, for the extension of the heavy truck route, which, which got a lot of attention about the time the board deal was done. Did, in, did include a bypass plan in Hammond mm -hmm. that, that Hammond said. It's been, on, it's been, around, yeah, it's been around a long time, and which they re-endorsed. And then the planning also went ahead on the Chicago side for what you now see under construction at uh, Torrance and Brainerd mm -hmm. and 130th. Um, it's there. It's a plan that just makes a huge amount of sense. Uh, it takes care of a lot of railroad and roadway conflicts. It uh, opens up the potential for, uh, for an extension of the heavy truck route. There's, there's 16 good reasons it should happen. Mm -hmm. The only reason I could think about about being a little more optimistic right now is that the Northwest Indiana RDA actually has some money. And, uh, and they, have made, they have made some fabulous investments. They, they have put $54 million in this Hammond uh, Lakes, this park thing I just talked about. They recently put um, a similar amount in uh, uh, Marquette, or, uh, Miller Park on the other end. Um, and they've got a number of proposals for uh, infrastructure improvements kind of all along the lake here. So they've got some real money. So um, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm mildly optimistic that uh, we, we've picked a bushel basket full of projects that are at least within the realm of, with some level of state collaboration, some cooperation between Chicago and Indiana, and now Northwest Indiana RDA actually having some real money from the sale of the turnpike mostly, but ongoing money from the casinos as well. So, so uh, there, may, there may be some funding reality. We, we think all 13, of the 60, we think these are the 13 that can get, get done, which is another way of asking your, answering your question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sir? Hey, let, let me ask, how does that plan, that conceptualization, uh, relate to the proposal of either a Port Authority or a Minneapolis M, you know, Metropolitan Council kind of regional this doesn't sound like it has the, the same kind of transgovernmental uh, unification. I, I'll give you just a very quick answer from the ULI experience. Uh, Lee Morris, who was a former uh, director of the of, uh, Illinois Department of Transportation, was on our ULI task force and, uh, and actually drafted some uh, joint uh, uh, documents that would take place between uh, IDOT and NDOT, uh, particularly on the road work, but in a moment of, of great optimism also drafted, which hasn't, I don't think, much seen the light of day, but also drafted a, the possibility of a joint port authority that would, because uh, uh, the port authority on the Indiana side is doing a lot of development, successful development around their port, industrial and job generating development. And uh, whether there will be the political will to ever bring that out into daylight or not is, is unknown. I, I think the Port Authority in Chicago, uh, the Civic Federation, is vocally advocating for its abolishment um, as an uh, uh, indecisive, uh, closed, relatively secret, uh, and largely ineffective except for recreational. And, and, um, and, and the point uh, is, is well taken that Port Authorities in many other jurisdictions uh, similar, similar, uh, similar size, even smaller jurisdictions than, Cincinnati, than Chicago. Cincinnati, uh, I think St. Paul is the largest economic development entity in the Twin Cities. Uh, certainly true in Cincinnati. It's certainly true uh, in a lot of other Midwestern communities. So uh, there certainly has all the bonding authority, the uh, eminent domain. Uh, uh, but it's 50 percent. Uh, People here know more about the structure of it than I do, but it's a 50% city, 50% state uh, paralysis at yeah. this point. So, Thank you. Yeah. Well, I just want to make a comment about the question about why did it blow up at Techie, for wow. instance. And our, our firm represented the Society of Design Word, and I worked with Steve Elrod from the very beginning on it. And I think there's two reasons why things like that blow up. One, because there is no ability within that structure in Illinois to 
share revenues. And when municipalities are looking at their own revenue generation needs, they their own total interest takes priority over um, whatever they might have agreed to on paper when they were in the planning mode. That's number one. Number two, the planning mode never takes into account the owner of the property and what their desire is. Director, I don't know if you can hear in the back, Janet is proffering two reasons why Technic uh, blew up. One was because the law doesn't provide for revenue sharing and every, every local government, of course, has its own uh, great need to increase revenue and the planning process doesn't take into account land ownership patterns, the owner. The owner and their desires. And their uh, desires. Uh, uh, Janet's absolutely right and the first point, I think, um, is something that requires um, immediate need for legislation, particularly in these times. Although some would say the towns of Kankakee and Shanahan may have found an interesting way um, for <laughs> revenue sharing in Illinois. Um, some may not call it sharing. Taking. Uh, <laughs> perhaps. But I, it is a need for immediate um, uh, change. Well, thank you all so very much uh, for that wonderful panel. Uh, we'll now take a 15 minute coffee break. Thanks.